It's The Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert, joining you from Baltimore. In its effort to isolate Iran and to tear up the Iranian nuclear agreement, the United States set a November 4th deadline for all countries to stop purchasing Iranian oil. However, various countries are showing signs of defiance against the U.S. now. One of these is India, which recently announced an agreement to purchase Iranian oil after the November 4th deadline. On top of that, India also signed a $5.4 billion agreement with Russia to buy five S-400 Triumph anti-aircraft defense systems. The Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, or CAATSA, which was signed into law last summer, listed banned Russian individuals and entities, many of which are related to the defense and the intelligence sectors. The U.S. State Department called India's violation of U.S. sanctions against Iran and Russia not helpful and implied that there would be specified consequences for India. Joining me now to make sense of the changing U.S.-Indian and U.S.-Russian relationship is Vijay Prashad. Vijay is executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and he's also the author or editor of over a dozen other books. His most recent book is an edited volume called Strongman, Putin, Erdogan, Duterte, Trump, and Modi, and was just published by OR Books. Thanks for joining us today, Vijay. Thanks a lot. So what is going on now? Let's focus on the U.S.-India relationship. Why is India openly defying the U.S. on sanctions against Russia and against Iran? Well, Greg, this issue is a pragmatic issue. I mean, India needs to import oil. India is a uh, oil deficit country, an energy deficit country. And it has, over the course of the last 50 years, um, relied upon oil from the Gulf Arab states and from Iran. Iran, like Venezuela, produces, and Libya, by the way, produces very high quality oil and therefore uh, is really essential for not only India, but China, Sri Lanka, many countries uh, around the Indian Ocean and in the South China Sea, which are able to bring oil in by oil tanker. So India's entire oil infrastructure is geared toward the kind of oil that comes out of Iran. It's been very difficult for India during the entire sanctions period before the Iran deal, the oil, uh, sorry, the nuclear deal in 2015 is very hard for, for India. And in that earlier period, India and Iran had made an arrangement for India to buy oil from Iran and Iran to take payment in rupees. You know, that agreement uh, was enabled by alternative financial mechanisms. And I think this is precisely what the Indian government would like to return to which is an alternative way to pay Iran for oil that it just cannot um, but import. I mean, there is no way for India to stop importing Iranian oil. The question has always been how India would be able to pay for it without incurring the heaviest penalty from the United States. So do you think that uh, India's defiance of U.S. sanctions um, would become a problem for India? I mean, what, what, what do you think will happen next with regard to the U.S.-India relationship? Well, the United States has an envoy uh, for its Iran policy, Brian Hook. And Mr. Hook came to India recently where he met the government and he said the United States is concerned. But of course, the United States understands that India has almost no alternative to Iranian oil. Uh, this is something that the US governments over the last couple of years, the last decade, in fact, um, have been able to have had to come to terms with. I mean, there literally is no other way for India to maintain uh, its energy supplies if it cuts off the Iran road. Now, this is, of course, something that India shares with the Europeans, with the Sri Lankans, with the Chinese, with others. These countries have also made it very clear that they rely upon Iranian oil. It's important to uh, recognize the United States cannot prevent Iran from selling oil. The only leverage the United States has is that this sale of oil cannot be done uh, using the US dollar as the transaction currency, and nor can this sale of oil uh, be ha have the payments uh, you know, go through networks that the United States controls, in other words, uh, mechanisms to transfer money, which is why the Europeans, the Indians, the Chinese, 
even the Japanese have been discussing an alternative banking system uh, to enable transactions for goods uh, coming out of countries that the United States has decided to sanction. You know, uh, it's important, I think, to underscore this. The U.S. government cannot stop trade itself. It can only sanction countries if they are using its mechanisms and its currency. And that's precisely what the Indian government, uh, I think, is in conversation with uh, other governments to go around. Well, this actually reminds me of the situation also with Venezuela, which uh, recently announced that it will stop uh, using the U.S. dollar to the largest extent it can and use other currencies, precisely because the U.S. has imposed financial sanctions on Venezuela. And of course, the other country that's been very heavily affected by uh, transactions and uh, the usage of dollar and that's moving away is Russia. So, but what does this mean now for the U.S.? I mean, more and more allies uh, of uh, the United States, including the European Union, are looking for ways to get around these kinds of sanctions, as you mentioned. Uh, doesn't this mean that the U.S. is, in effect, actually isolating itself instead of Iran? Well, I think if I was in the U.S. government, if I was in the Treasury Department, if I was in Wall Street, I would worry about this. Uh, it's important to put this in context. About 39% of world transactions are done in dollars. You know, the dollar is not 100% controlling all transactions about 30-odd percent is run through the euro. So it's 39 percent is a considerable amount of global transactions. And often these are for some of, you know, the most important sectors, such as oil, where the Saudis and others insist upon uh, payments in dollars. Now, if the United States persists with the sanctions policy against Iran, and if this leads countries, you know, these are countries, quite mainstream countries, not marginal countries like Japan and the European Union, India, Russia, China. If these countries decide to create an alternative mechanism uh, to transact international trade, to make payments, to, to uh, run the payments through, you know, a wire transfer system that goes around the SWIFT system based in Belgium. If this infrastructure is created by these other countries, I think this would put a great deal of pressure on the United States, which has relied on the global use of the dollar to run up major deficits, to print money inside the country, because it knows that if it prints money inside the United States, it will not incur inflation, because this currency is utilized globally. If the currency is utilized less on a global stage, U.S. deficits will not so easily be you know, uh, taken care of and inflation might rise inside the United States. So this could end up being an own goal for the Trump administration or indeed any U.S. administration that pushes its own allies into creating an alternative banking system. This actually uh, brings me on another issue, which might seem a bit of a tangent, but actually I think it's very closely related, and that's the U.S.-Saudi uh, Arabia relationship. I mean, lots of people ask themselves, themselves especially now with the recent uh, murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, why the United States continues to insist on this close relationship with Saudi Arabia. And uh, I want to ask you, could it be perhaps also related to the petrodollar in the sense that, as you said, Saudi Arabia uses the petrodollar insists on payments in the in dollars and this would be one way of maintaining the US uh, the dollar as a global currency well I think the Saudis play such an essential role to the United States I mean you know it's US gas purchases for instance and gas pur purchases around the world that bring in the massive wealth to Saudi Arabia and its sovereign fund this wealth is held in dollars in other words it enables the US dollar to remain a global currency. And this wealth is also recycled into U.S. banks, into Wall Street. And, uh, you know, not only by the Saudis holding their sovereign wealth fund in dollars, but also by the massive obscene purchases of arms uh, by Saudi Arabia, which are a kind of subsidy for the American arms industry. So Saudi Arabia plays this dual or maybe triple role on the one hand, it recycles U.S. dollars into uh, Wall Street, liquefies Wall Street, enables Wall Street to produce a massive fictional uh, economy with derivatives and so on. Secondly, 
Saudi Arabia buys an enormous amount of arms, subsidizes the U.S. arms industry. And third, by insisting on taking payments in dollars, it maintains, particularly with weaker countries, uh, the hegemony of the dollar when other countries are quite eager to seek a different way or perhaps even a combined way of dealing with uh, you know, international trade and their own value of their currency. You know, many countries would not like their currency to be measured only against the US dollar, but against a bundle of currencies, you know, maybe the euro, maybe the renminbi, maybe even some of the most stable currencies, uh, such as the, the currencies of Oman and, and other Gulf countries, which don't seem to move very much. So this, you know, utilization of Saudi Arabia as a kind of trigger uh, to maintain the hegemony of the U.S. dollar is fundamental, you know, in the way things work uh, around the world. Okay. Well, we're definitely going to come back to this topic, I'm sure, but we'll leave it there for now. I'm speaking to Vijay Prashad, Executive Director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Thanks again, Vijay, for having joined us today. Thanks, Craig. And thank you for joining The Real News Network.